So I love going to garage sales and finding cool stuff. A couple years ago now, I stumbled upon this amazing Apple PowerBook G3 Lombard for only $5. Can you believe it? This computer was released by Apple back in 1999, and this specific Lombard model was released in three different variations. Although my model had been upgraded, judging by the 6GB hard drive it came with, it falls in the middle faster model category. That means it was originally priced at $3,500, which adjusting for inflation would make this computer cost the equivalent of $6,400 today. My machine had been upgraded to 320 megabytes of RAM from the 64 it shipped with. It also came with an aftermarket slot loading DVD burner, and I upgraded the hard drive in this machine to an old 24 gigabyte MSATA SSD that I had laying around. I used a mini PCIe to IDE adapter to fit it in there, and I also downgraded the OS from an early version of Mac OS X to Mac OS 9.2 since there's a lot more games for classic Mac OS. In this video, I'll be focusing more on the 3D games, since that's what will really push this hardware. For graphics, this Mac does have an 8MB ATI Rage LT Pro, a graphics chip with built-in 2D and 3D hardware acceleration, capable of driving multiple displays and even supporting OpenGL. This is a low-power mobile graphics chip that had been around the PC world for a couple years prior, so I am very curious to see what kind of games you can run on it. I mean, after all, this was a $3,500 computer. Well, let's start out today with an absolute classic, Quake. First, I tested out the latest version of GL Quake, version 1.1b3, which was the last version for OS 9. As for the performance, GL Quake is kinda slow on this computer. I am running the game at the lowest possible graphic settings, 640x480 with thousands of colors and 16-bit texture quality. At the lowest settings, I do consider this playable, but the game does slow down significantly when there's a lot of action on screen. I personally like to play the original Quake with software rendering. The smooth textures that the OpenGL version had were impressive back in the day, but in the early days, before I got my first 3DFX card, I always played with software rendering. I'm used to it. It works so much better than OpenGL on this computer. Here I had set the main screen resolution to 800 by 600, then within the game I used the 400 by 300 resolution with double pixels enabled. This allowed me to play in full screen mode and increase the frame rate substantially by sacrificing visual quality. There are many better ways to play Quake these days, but I do want to mention that if you choose to play Quake on OS 9, you should absolutely update to the latest version of Quake for Mac, version 1.09. It fixes issues playing the CD audio when using Mac OS 9, and you gotta play Quake with the CD audio. That's part of what made the game's atmosphere so special. So moving on, I checked out Quake 2. First, I used the OpenGL driver at 640x480, and it was immediately apparent that I was hitting the limits of what this laptop could handle. I turned the graphics all the way down, but it still felt too slow to be enjoyable nowadays. However, back in the day, the frame rate would have probably been good enough. OpenGL was like the next level of graphics, and I know I would have played it with this kind of frame rate if that's all I had. I mean, this was before the PlayStation 2 was even released. But just like the original Quake, this game works much better using software rendering, which I would personally prefer if I was to play through this game on this computer. I probably wouldn't play it on here though. Let me quickly touch on Quake 3 by just saying that it didn't run well on this machine. Even on the lowest settings, with the lowest resolution and the lowest graphical options, it only gave me around 15 to 25 frames per second, which is pretty bad for a competitive shooter. And it looks pretty bad too. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a way to use software rendering for this game, which I thought was an option, but I might be wrong. Anyways, this laptop is not a good fit for Quake 3. Next, I tried out the classic open world game, Driver. Now this one had a weird problem, where for some reason, I couldn't get the game to output to the external VGA. Like it didn't know what to do in the presence of multiple monitors, and it would just turn the screens gray and crash. But thankfully the game works just fine on the internal display. Overall, this game is playable with graphics set to low and the view distance set to a modest halfway or so. It's not the best frame rate, but it definitely is playable. Driver came out the same year as this laptop, so I would probably expect it to push it. 
Next up is Crow Mag Rally, a kart racer similar to Mario Kart, but with cavemen. I tried playing it at the lowest settings, 640x480 with 16-bit color, but it ran poorly. However, I soon realized that virtual memory was still enabled, so I disabled it, and that helped to increase the frame rate a bit. Overall, the game is playable, but not enjoyable due to its poor performance on this less powerful Mac. It's a great game, but it's better played on a more powerful computer. Next, I wanted to try out some older first-person shooters, and the first one that came to mind was the classic game Doom. I installed the Ultimate Doom from the disc, and it worked perfectly right out the box without any issues. Although there is an option to play with a mouse and keyboard, I prefer playing with a USB gamepad. To make this work, I used the control panel USB Overdrive to map the keyboard inputs to the controller. Overall, Doom is running great on this Mac. The next shooter I tried out was a more advanced one than Doom. Duke Nukem 3D Atomic Edition, to be precise. This was another hassle-free game. Just pop in the CD, install it, and away you go. There might be some updates out there, but I didn't run into any issues. This laptop runs the game smoothly at 800x600 in full screen mode. It's impressive how well the game performs on this machine. I did, however, forget just how many keys are involved in the gameplay, making it difficult to map this one to a gamepad. Might want to plug in an external mouse for this game. Don't have time to play with myself. Let's move on to some Bungie Marathon games. I'm playing Marathon 2 here, but all the Marathon games run flawlessly on this PowerBook. It's an ideal choice if you want to experience the original Marathon games on original hardware. It's worth mentioning that the game won't take up the entire screen unless you first lower the resolution to 640x480 before launching the app. But yeah, it's Marathon, a truly foundational series in Bungie's history. The results for 3D games on this Mac were interesting, but the ultimate test is a piece of software that was revolutionary when it was released. I'm talking about Virtual Game Station. This software allowed users to play their original PlayStation discs on their Macs, which was unheard of at the time. It was available during the relevance of PS1, a year before the PS2 was even released. It's like playing PS5 discs on a MacBook, which is absolutely crazy. The two games I tested out were Spyro Year of the Dragon and Croc. First, I tried Spyro, which ran quite well without any major hiccups and at mostly the speed of real hardware. Next, I tried the 3D platformer Croc, which also played the game at mostly the speed of real hardware. This app natively supports USB controllers, and you can even use actual PlayStation controllers on it with a USB adapter. If you had this software back in the day, you wouldn't even need the actual console. You could just buy the discs and play them on your PowerBook. It was truly amazing, but of course Sony wasn't happy with it and tried suing the developers. Sony lost in court and then ended up buying the company just to shut it down. It's not hard to see why though, as this app is simply awesome. For my next test, I wanted to play Jazz Jackrabbit 2 on this PowerBook. It's a classic 2D platformer that brings back some great memories. I had a feeling this computer would be able to handle 2D games just fine, and as you'll see, that's pretty much the case. The game ran smoothly at the max 640x480 resolution. Overall, the game played well with a little screen tearing on the VGA output. And for this game, I recommend using a gamepad for the best experience. Unfortunately, my USB gamepad wasn't detected, but I was able to map the keyboard controls to the gamepad using USB overdrive. I had a blast playing this game, and I highly recommend giving it a try if you haven't already. Next, I tried out a bit of the classic Prince of Persia 2, which this specific version I'm using here is called the Prince of Persia Collection, that contains both the first and second games for both Mac and PC on one CD. I believe this was a budget release, but nowadays it's going for around 50 bucks. This is a great little computer to play the original Prince of Persia games. After that, I decided to try out an exciting shoot-em-up game called Deimos Rising. I'm happy to report that this game performed exceptionally well on this PowerBook. Although it's a challenging game, it was a blast to play and handled great using a gamepad. If you're into the Mars Rising and Deimos Rising games, then this is a great computer for those types of shooters. 
For my last test, I played a platformer game called Ferrazel's Wand. This game is known to have some speed issues with pre-G3 PowerPC Max due to its advanced graphics and gameplay for the time. But on this PowerBook, it ran smoothly with all enhanced graphical settings turned on. This game supports input sprockets, so it works great with all your USB gamepads and such. It makes it a breeze to set up the controls. I did experience some screen tearing while playing, especially on the VGA output, but it wasn't a big issue that would ruin the gameplay. So overall, these results were interesting, but I don't think this PowerBook is the ideal machine for classic Mac gaming. I mean, back then it probably wouldn't have been a bad way to play some of these games, as consoles didn't always provide a solid 60 frames per second either. It was not common. In my opinion, if you purchased this PowerBook for other reasons, like having internet access or a sweet DVD player in 1999, the fact that it can run most games you throw at it, and the fact that you can play some of them with OpenGL is fantastic. I've had many Macs that wouldn't even attempt to run these games. For the most part, everything I tested today had playable frame rates, but in today's world, I wouldn't go out of my way to find one of these power books for gaming. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to leave a like on it to let me know. And if you haven't already, make sure to hit that subscribe button for more videos like this. Thanks so much for your time today. Goodbye.